Hello and welcome to another episode of Flights of Fancy Podcast, the podcast where we talk about military and combat aviation past, present, and future. Today's episode is going to be about a very interesting French aircraft named the Breguet 27 or 27. And we're going to be uh, going through the usual uh, rigmarole of the uh, design or the designer, the design of the aircraft itself, its uses, and uh, its eventual fate. As always, I'm your host, Mr. Ohm, and with me, as always, my co-host, Mr. X. Hey. So, uh, I was actually pretty excited about this one, just because, one, uh, it's an aircraft that I don't think it's talked about ever. Uh, it's got a very striking design, and uh, hopefully I will have resolved a... Uh, uh, a slight enigma I've had uh, surrounding this aircraft and photos of it. So without further ado, uh, we'll just jump straight in. Uh, first and foremost, as it is always the case with new companies and new designers, uh, we need to talk about the essential uh, father of the company uh, known as Breguet Aviation or La Société des Ateliers d'Aviation Louis Breguet. Now, Mr. Louis-Charles Breguet was born in 1880 uh, and will be yet another company that follows in the same lines as we've seen uh, in previous episodes. Namely, uh, Mr. Breguet finds himself as a pioneer of early aviation, um, even though he doesn't necessarily have a background in aeronautics, just because it didn't really exist at the time. Um, he sees himself enlisting the help of family in order to complete projects early on uh, in his aviation career. Now, uh, the first few designs follow the same sort of um, pattern uh, as you would see in very early aircraft designs. Um, one of the first ones that he ever made was the Breguet Richet gyroplane, which is more of a sort of static helicopter. Um, there was a, um, back in, in the very old days, uh, you would typically see two sorts of creations. Um, one of those creations would be of the um, static position where someone would, would sit down, sort of like a cockpit, uh, and they would have what looks to be like a very crude uh, helicopter. And typically you wouldn't get too much out of it. You might generate enough uh, force to gain a few feet off the ground, but control was tough, um, and you certainly couldn't get any real sense of longevity out of it. The project that we saw, uh, that we see on the left, is one such uh, example where it could perform flight tests, very rudimentary ones, but they were mostly static, and uh, you needed to have four people uh, standing, uh, essentially holding on to the uh, various hard points of the gyroplane in order to make sure that it was fine. Um, these are also wheels, so they, uh, they also serve as balance points for when it's actually on the ground. And the pilot would be in this sort of central uh, position. Um, sadly, there's no real other photos about this gyroplane. Um, and even the name itself is more of a misnomer, um, just by the view that we have. Uh, just because a gyroplane is more of a mix between an aircraft and uh, a uh, an aircraft, uh, or a helicopter that we would normally uh, understand them to be in modern times. Um, that aside, designs went into the more traditional route, as you would see with the Wright brothers, the Short brothers, and so on with a more uh, traditional you know, biplane design, large tails to uh, help generate lift, and uh, your typical engine in front, uh, man controlling plane, and so on. Now, by the year 1911, uh, Mr. Breguet manages to found his own aviation company um, and find success as most other companies would at the time uh, thanks to the uh, breakout of conflict in Europe uh, that we know of as World War I. One of the biggest successes uh, for Mr. Breguet was his Breguet 14 uh, bomber, uh, 
Now, this was a two-seater position, or two-seater bomber, um, had a defensive gunner with two machine guns, and was a resounding success, so much so that the Americans uh, used it to a large degree. Now, Incidentally, the uh, Brigette 14 is one of the uh, first planes to have flaps in its design. Oh, yeah. You can see... I think those are the ailerons. Look at the uh, lower... Yeah, uh, well, so... They've got they got flaps, but I'm curious to know if they might have had flaps in the uh, upper wings as well. Probably not. But. It doesn't look like it from pictures with it deployed. It's just that rear lower span uh, folding downwards is very, very primitive flaps, mind, but flaps. Flaps nonetheless. Welcome to the future, everyone. <laughs> uh, so the company itself uh, survives for quite some time. And in 1931, uh, we can see just a small portion of the um, uh, of one of the factories that was used. Now, uh, the way that France had it was you typically have uh, several different companies within uh, certain areas. So in uh, this photo example, we have Breguet having a very small portion uh, in the Le Havre area. Um, and there's also a, a larger field and associated factory uh, that is given to uh, Société Schneider. So Schneider is a different company, uh, and they just happen to be in the same areas. Now, uh, before we get to the aircraft itself, it's important to note that um, because of the way that uh, manufacturers were at once split into having factories in several different locations. Um, those locations also had uh, essential, essentially groupings of several different factories, several different companies. Um, and what would eventually happen is a sort of um, mass unionization uh, of factories. Um, what the French government had decided is that in the years between uh, I think it started in 1934 and going further into uh, up in, into the uh, early years of, of uh, World War II. Um, essentially, the French uh, would buy out companies or factories in these strategic locations and regroup them into uh, societies or essentially uh, uh, new manufacturing groups. So uh, Breguet was a company that managed to find itself in a sort of middle ground. Um, many of the factories that, or, or companies that just didn't perform well were sort of bought outright, um, whereas others like Breguet, or more successful ones, managed to either keep their factories entirely or only partially divested some to, uh, to the state. In Breguet's uh, example, they lost two, one being uh, to the... Um, the Western and one to the Northern uh, societies. Um, despite having lost two factories, uh, it wasn't a significant impact enough for Breguet to have to fold. Uh, and in fact, even bought La Técoire, which is yet another aviation company we'll talk about uh, in the future, uh, acquiring their Toulouse Montaudrin and Biscarros factories. Um, these uh, these sorts of acquisitions and uh, both the nationalization side uh, as well as uh, Breguet's purchases of La Tecoire, um make it a very hectic uh, sort of time for um, aviation, not only design, but manufacturing in, uh, in France at the time. Um, this is uh, generally seen just by the amount of change that occurs when you change uh, the owners, the bosses, managers, and, and so on, um, from what would have previously existed before purchases or buyouts um, to what they, uh, what they eventually switched over, uh, thanks to French uh, state purchases and so on. Uh, this leads to a lot of problems um, with uh, manufacturing and is one of the main reasons for uh, the failings, quote-unquote, um, of the French Air Force during World War II. Now, despite 
the loss of several factories, the buyouts of more. Um, La uh, Brigue itself managed to survive and uh, survive up until 1971. In 1971, they merged with yet another French company uh, called Dassault um, and have been defunct ever since. Now, Dassault, uh, I forget if they have gone uh, defunct yet. I don't believe so. Um, but essentially, uh, it's one of those inevitable fates that seem to befall uh, many aviation companies uh, as time moves on. Now, today's aircraft, uh, as mentioned prior, is the Breguet 27. It's a very interesting design um, just because it doesn't really have any sort of uh, comparison uh, as soon as you look at the rear of the aircraft. Um, the prototype itself was designed in, uh, or was a response to a design request for a new reconnaissance aircraft by the French Army Air Force, or FAAF, in 1928. Uh, the designers Marcel Villerme uh, and René Dorin, sadly I have no information on either of them, uh, settled on a biplane design with sesquiplane characteristics. Now, what a sesquiplane characteristic, or what that means, is essentially that the uh, upper wing is larger than the lower wing. So, typically, uh, it'll be the top wings that are that are larger, um, and there's no real necessity for how large or uh, what the ratio is between the two uh, the two wing groups. Uh, or wing pairs. As long as they're not equivalent, it's technically a sesquiplane. Um, the Briguet also with the uh, unique design of the uh, the tail spar or tail boom uh, is rather uh, unique. There's it's very rare to find any other aircraft uh, design that uh, that does this. There may be some in, in prototypes, but none that have ever seen uh, production as with the uh, the Breguet 27. Now, this is very useful um, for such an aircraft because uh, typically biplanes, you're, you're for, for reconnaissance aircraft anyways, uh, you'll have your pilot who will generally be afforded some amount of view in front, um, be able to uh, look down and forwards, and should have a good position uh, for the cockpit to do so. Whereas the rear position uh, with the observer slash gunner is the one that's going to be doing a lot of the uh, relaying of information, whether that's to the pilot himself uh, or to uh, via radio to uh, people uh, in other groups that are relying on such information. So the Breguet itself, unfortunately, wasn't a very successful aircraft in the trials that were put forth for it. Um, it while it had 500 horsepowers of engine power, uh, it still doesn't generate a lot of speed. 236 uh, 36 kilometers is not a very fast, um, fast amount. Uh, you can, you don't have that much armor on it. And it just doesn't really perform in the way that they would have wanted. Um, so despite the shortcomings of the aircraft itself, the French military are sort of finding themselves in a bind. And they order 85 of them in 1930, and uh, essentially will have a few slight changes to the design and uh, try to work out any other issues as they go along. Now, interestingly, um, the there is a uh, forward firing machine gun, which is very hard to find on schematics or drawings. Uh, it appears to be somewhere in the cheeks of the aircraft at the front. Now I've seen diagrams that seem to show a mounting on the left side or the right side. I'm not sure if maybe it's a flipped image and I'm just not looking at it correctly, or if there was a mount that it was included on either side of the engine, um, and I just uh, haven't been able to, to correctly parse that um, from the information I have. 
Now, the defensive gunner would have uh, two machine guns pointing back, and that's sort of where the cut-down tail comes into play. Now, we can see that the, the tail essentially goes to a very sharp point before connecting to a metal spar that it itself connects to the tail. The uh, prototype had a, a slightly rounder tail, uh, and we can see that the horizontal stabilizers um, are, or the yeah, horizontal stabilizers are much higher positioned than what the design would eventually have. And uh, this cut down tail essentially makes it so that the rear observer has that much more view over the battlefield or just in the sky, uh, and has less of uh, their own aircraft to potentially shoot at. And I say this because um, there aren't too many checks and balances in place for a rear gunner to not shoot at their own aircraft. So the last thing you really want to do is have a uh, larger chunk of uh, duralumin or uh, steel or other materials uh, that you would essentially just pepper with holes and next thing you know you have turned yourself into your own casualty. Um, another interesting factor of the design was that um, there are several fuel tanks in this aircraft. Um, the two ones that typically will get talked about are the uh, are two fuel tanks in the lower wing pair. Now, um, it's not entirely clear how this system to me is supposed to work. Uh, the NACA. Um, the brochure on this aircraft uh, mentions that they are droppable in flight. Um, it's unknown to me if this is just a pull lever that the pilot has access to at all times, um, but it does imply that uh, where the fuel tanks would be, um, they are they is simply free fall, meaning that they're not. They, they aren't uh, covered on the underside by any sort of uh, sheet metal or uh, fabric covering. As soon as uh, that item is tripped, whatever the case may be, they just simply uh, fall out of the aircraft, fill, uh, full or otherwise. Now, uh, interesting enough, there are mentions that they can have two leading edge wing tanks. Uh, essentially, these are exactly the same size and profile as the normal uh, leading edge, um, just simply filled with gasoline instead. Uh, we can see a bunch of fe uh, figures here that are taken from the NACA brochure itself. Um, there will be a few uh, recurring images uh, that we'll see later that will just have a, a slightly higher um, resolution to them. This figure for the lower wing with room for the fuel tanks yes so the fuel tanks we can see take up about this much space um, they're slightly over the gear uh, landing gear but since the landing gear is fixed uh, you don't really have to worry about where that will fold into so you had a lot of uh, available uh, space and uh, we'll get to see it in a couple other photos just how the duralumin setup is um, and why I believe that the fuel tanks will be flush with the leading edge. Um, I think that's kind of why there's a, a gap that we can see between these two. Um, so the, the fuel tanks are flush and whatever you do to release them drops them out just straight down. Um, we can also see the upper wing construction. Uh, so you can see kind of the inner workings uh, and how, um, how you get rig uh, rigidity out of these wings. And just sort of uh, where metal sort of meets with each other. Um, additionally, in figure 10 on the top right, we can see that this is the uh, essentially the main boom or spar uh, that the um, that the aircraft employs. Uh, this is actually the entire uh, frame. Uh, figure 11, which you can see over here, is the um, the cockpit controls. That's the uh, you've got the pilot yoke. Uh, you've got the uh, the rudder pedals, and I'm not entirely sure uh, what uh, what these two gadgets are. But essentially, you're seeing the uh, the entire um, uh, setup for the aircraft. 
Uh, figure 15 s mentions something about the um, the mounting bracket, which I believe is here. And again, we'll see uh, we'll see it uh, slightly better in future photos. Um, another thing that seems to be praised or that was mentioned um, by the brochure and other uh, documents as well is that the Pleguet 27 has some very nice and wide doors that provide access to the aircraft. Um, and we'll get to see that uh, further, further along. There's mentions of three doors uh, on the aircraft, and really what they mean is that there are two for the pilot, one on each side uh, that's covered at the moment, and one for the gunner. Um, additionally, there are a couple other uh, things to note. Um, so the uh, there's special mention in NACA Aircraft Circular number 127, which is for the Breguet 27, um, that it is a, a structure that's easily dismountable as a unit. Um, that's why when I was uh, in the previous page, when I'm talking about the entire frame, that's essentially what they do is uh, you've got, say, the engine block up here, or the, not the engine block, but the, um, uh, the sort of firewall area uh, that splits the cockpit and the engine. Um, and has like the most support for the aircraft. Uh, essentially, everything is just a box that gets just put on and, and bracketed uh, onto the aircraft. Well, it probably starts actually from there. But, uh, regardless, um, it, uh, it makes it a little handy for one of the conversions we'll see later. Um, but it's interesting to note how they wanted to, uh, to essentially build uh, the aircraft as, uh, as we see it. Um, again, there's mentions of three doors, uh, but two of them are for the, the cockpit, uh, and they're, they're so-called quick dismount or, or quick detach in that you can pull a, le a lever and then essentially kick the door out, um, which makes it just easier for, uh, jumping out to save yourself. Um, additionally, we have a nice little apparatus over here. This is essentially a bomb site. This is a bomb site that uh, existed before the mechanical types. And what I mean by this is that um, back in the old days, uh, you had to rely on um, a lot more visual guesswork and, and um, a lot more primitive means in order to bomb a target. And so uh, we can see some uh, some of the details required. Uh, I'm not fully versed in all of these calculations. Um, oh, if you give me some time, I could probably do things, but it's it's like velocity. Uh, it's like maximum velocity to targets, and then uh, your aiming point is the middle of C, and then you're calculating the other maximum or your other velocity. And, I know some of it, just not enough to to uh, properly explain it. Um, yeah, I think from 1943 onwards, the IL-2 gets some vaguely similar stuff in that it has a nose where you have uh, some horizontal lines on your reticle and then hmm. lines on the nose. And what you do is you fly a fixed speed, pick the altitude you're at, you correspond the uh, line in your reticle to the line on the nose to get a like a proper angle, so your your eyes are in line with a given line, mm -hmm. and then you just drop the bombs when you when that line passes over the target. Yeah, we we'll see the same sort of um, applications if um, the next time we cover a, a dive bomber. I think I think most of them uh, at the time where we'll actually cover a dive bomber, we'll have had the uh, the same sort of uh, uh, lines and, and uh, drawings just uh, just immediately applied to the cockpit, which just makes it a lot easier for uh, the user. I could have sworn that a lot of the point of dive bombing was to avoid all of that messing around with angles and stuff. You just kind of point your nose directly down at the thing. and Well, some so some aircraft were, uh, were just had an easier time at bombing at say a 60 degree angle and in order to to calculate your angle you'd have lines just drawn on the side of the cockpit so that you could reference the ground's position to the uh, the angle written right um 
but uh, regardless of all that, um, th it just means that this method is rather primitive. Your observer is having to lean out over the side of the aircraft, as this is an out outer uh, attachment, um, and is kind of uh, playing it by ear, or more specifically by eye, and makes the entire endeavor just that much more difficult. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind and is uh, something that's interesting, um, not exactly unique, but uh, there is mention that the observer is given its own windshield. We'll see that in, in larger detail later, but um, it's just not something I would typically expect for how, given for how large it is. Especially since the pilot also has um, his own windshield, and so I'm surprised that uh, it it's not enough um, given uh, given the circumstances. So uh, oh, with that, that is surprising, especially with how much they stick up. Mm -hmm. We can see a really good example of these windshields that essentially uh, connect the uh, the main body to the upper wing, and I, I just would assume that this would be enough. I'm I guess. Just surprised as well that they didn't have it completely extend to the observer. Um, seems like it would just make it a lot easier. Um, we can kind of see that sort of gap in between the uh, the two cockpits, or the cockpit and the observer. Um, it's not exactly large, so I don't know. They, they had a decision for it. Um, regardless of all that, the the prototype version, as specifically as previously mentioned, um, is sometimes referred to as the two seventy point zero one, and this sort of leads into uh, the typical naming that the French would employ for their aircraft. Um, this follows suit a lot more for Breguet, um, I believe, uh, Farman or Farman uh, Amio. Uh, De White Scene and one or two others will typically have this the same sort of naming structure in that the parent aircraft or the um, family of the aircraft will be the first two digits. Um, so in this case, it'd be Breguet 27 or 27. And every, every number after the 27, usually in ascending order, will be all the subsequent variants of the uh, the initial design. So uh, in this instance, we see the uh, 270, and the French had a, uh, as, with the, as we saw with the Curtis episode, had a sort of different way of naming uh, their aircraft, which is different from the company's uh, way of naming the aircraft. So uh, this one is a 270, but it's a 270, and then it, I believe the marking on the back says A2. So it would be for the army, and it's uh, two for essentially two seats. I need to just bring up my pen more often. Um, anyways, so all to say that this is uh, essentially the main version that uh, that a lot of people would see. Uh, the 270 gets a slightly different engine. It's harder to tell just because of the way that um, the the engine cowlings are built. They kind of just have large noses and they're ungainly. But uh, one of the, the easier ways to determine is uh, between a prototype anyways and the, the regular version of the 270 is the position of the, uh, the chin radiator uh, is just a, a in a different location because of the different engine uh, involved. Um, now, the side profile of this engine doesn't help us in determining the side of the machine gun or where the machine gun is located, which is just a little annoying. Um, it is not this hole, as far as I know. And as far as I can tell, it may be uh, on the other side. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, there is a very large space uh, between the pilot and the engine, and the firewall is essentially here. And behind it, where we can see these two doors, are actually the bomb bay. Uh, 
it's an internal position in the aircraft uh, that can either hold bombs or other munitions, um, flares, etc. Uh, but typically, if not holding bombs, will be the location where they actually have the camera in order for them to uh, act as their reconnaissance uh, mission. Now we can see uh, here that there's a few different missions that the aircraft was involved with. Typically, they were given, uh, well, uh, for the 27, they were given five general missions. Uh, and we can also see just the, the chassis of the aircraft. So uh, this side is the tail. And this is the nose of the aircraft. So we can they see... Kind of stuck a beam out there for the empennage, didn't they? Yeah, it, everything literally just like falls in as a box onto, uh, onto this main uh, spar. Again, you've got your... Uh, your bomb bay slash firewall, that's all combined in there, which splits. Uh, we have that, that horseshoe shape for, uh, for the connect, I believe. And then there's a pilot yoke and, and so on. Your rudder controls, your pedal controls are just in front. Um, so you can see kind of how it connects to the lower wings as well. And how uh, these are the, uh, those are actually the landing gear um, spokes where the wheels fit in. Um, interestingly enough, the um, the Breguet was given a, a an assortment of missions. Um, one that I'm particularly surprised by, uh, namely mission number three. So in uh, in ascending order, we've got observation, which is uh, typical for what they they asked for. You have uh, bombardment, or what they would normally just call uh, bombing missions. Um, specifically, this is medium, so there was a possibility of having an even larger uh, or lourd for a larger bomb load. They have a night fighter version, which is, uh, I'm not sure if that's desperation or just a very strong willingness to believe that the aircraft could do it. Um, Reconnaissance and bombardment, so if they wanted to have a mix between observation and bombing, as well as just uh, night bombing uh, for uh, for uh, missions where it didn't necessarily have to protect itself uh, as much. Uh, we can also see a very nice diagram, uh, or several nice uh, photos and one nice diagram. Um, on the top left, we see where the fuel tanks would be. Uh, we're given... I believe this is the right wing. Uh, and we can see just where the fuel tank fits and how it's supposed to be flush with uh, the uh, the front of the wing. And again, as the, uh, as the pilot performs or uh, pulls on a lever or other such apparatus, the, uh, the fuel tank is meant to just drop out. We see yet again the uh, size of the door for and we see a little bit of the opening for the uh, for the far side for the pilot, and we have a nice little diagram that that shows uh, in sort of a slight, slight brag just how much uh, observation can be achieved with the uh, with the briguet. This is typically a, a photo you'd see for a brochure by the company itself. Uh, in order to try and sell its product to other nations. Yeah, they usually have some information on the plane, some incredible hyperbole, and are printed on very nice paper. Yeah, they're they're typically uh, yeah they're they're nice uh, advertisements uh, and selling uh, selling points. Um, again, we can see just a slightly uh, more close up picture of where the pilot is to sit down we can see the the yoke that he's holding on to and uh, any of the controls the very large windshield and just how uh, it seems to be a more rugged construction um, it's definitely interesting to look at how different it is uh, compared to what cockpits look like uh, even for um, uh, aircraft that show up you know three four years after this one we can see uh, in the top middle just how uh, large, how tall the observer's windshield is. Um, as well, the windshield uh, provides, I believe there's two hooks. Uh, 
um, or maybe it's just side by side for uh, machine gun drums. So for the observer to shoot back at enemy aircraft, um, his position while seated also makes the observer kind of have to stand up uh, if they want to actually observe anything uh, or shoot back at um, any aggressors. And in the bottom middle, uh, this will be on the right side of the aircraft uh, or the engine. Uh, we can see the there's a bracket for uh, the mount and the machine gun is here. Um, but finding out where exactly it's supposed to shoot out from is kind of tough because you can rely on this large bracket as a sort of uh, you know, locating piece, but it never really seems like there's a, a specific outlet for it. So I don't know, maybe it's just uh, my eyes are going, uh, going bad. Uh, further, we can see that the, oh, yeah. again, we can see the mounting, the bracket on the large spar, and there's nothing like the bullets shoot out from here, but there's no opening. So that's probably just um, the way that the um, the cowling is made for the engine. So there would be an opening, but it kind of looks more like it'd be for exhaust on here. So does it shoot out of here or is it not equipped on this aircraft? I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell. Um, so it can, it does have a forward firing gun. There are multiple photos that prove this. It's just kind of tough figuring out how exactly it's supposed to fit in, uh, in all of this. Um, now, to speak of the uh, Brea 27, uh, it's important to note that uh, it wasn't a major success. Um, while there's a lot of interesting features on it, and it does seem to uh, deliver on the ability to be a, a reconnaissance slash observation aircraft. Um, it does suffer in a few areas, uh, speed and defense being one of, uh, well, two of them. Now, um, the Breguet 27 and essentially the prototypes and the 270 would be the largest uh, production variants of the entire family amounting to about 198 of the 227 or slightly more uh, examples built before the uh, the design itself was retired. Um, the major, the next major version that would ever uh, see production would be the uh, the 33 or Briquet 33. Now this was essentially just an offshoot of the 27, so it's why they gave it a different uh, starting designation, I'm not entirely sure. Um, this is a little confusing when uh, at least one of the 33s was renamed the 27S, and again, I'm not 100% uh, sure why. Now one of the things to, um, to also mention or note about the 33 is that uh, originally, it was designed in order to optimize the um, long distance flight potential of the aircraft. This was uh, exemplified in the uh, the two 33s that were built, um, or originally built anyways, uh, flying from uh, Paris to Hanoi and back, and a second one flying mostly a tour of Asia, uh, going as far as Tokyo, but also um, flying to uh, several other major uh, Asian cities before making its way back to Paris. So the the 33 kind of generates a little bit of interest in the 270 again, um, and they look at uh, implementing some of the changes that the 33 brought to the 27 design, um, but it doesn't, there's no evidence that shows that it really goes anywhere. Um, we can see a few notes from a later NACA aircraft circular on the 33 uh, that mentioned the long distance observing, um, how it was fitted with radio instruments, photography instruments, and radio and photography stuff, um, and just how the increased engine power, because it went from a 500 horsepower to a 650, and eventually to a 750 uh, horsepower aircraft, uh, to carry essentially more bombs um, 
Why it's mentioned specifically what it can carry is a little optimistic or interesting because, uh, again, the 33 was never a major production variant. So whether it's because 27s were given a new engine and then treated as uh, a 33 standard is something I've never been able to uh, quite clear up in the uh, documentation I have. Um, this is the, or at least one of the 33s that we can see. Uh, there's no machine guns, there's no brackets, uh, it doesn't have the bomb sight, and uh, everything essentially uh, indicates that these two pilots, um, which I've, I've sadly forgotten their names, um, are just the essentially just flying a uh, civilian uh, version of the 27. And uh, interestingly, this photo actually shows one of the filler caps for the internal and uh, f internal fuel tanks. So um, kind of leads uh, a little bit more credence to the top being uh, obviously the steel slash duralumin slash alloy and the, uh, the fuel tank just drops out if the lever is ever pulled. Um, we also get a slightly better look at one of the windows on the side of the aircraft, uh, which would look directly into the bomb bay or uh, otherwise area that the, uh, the photography equipment would be placed in. Now it's interesting to note as well that um, the photography equipment could essentially grab two separate angles um, it would either take a photo obliquely backwards, so down and to the left or down and to the right, or uh, there was a window directly underneath the aircraft so it could take vertical photos um, from the bomb bay itself. Sadly, because of the lack of specialized aircraft for observation or uh, otherwise um, similar uh, missions or objectives, um, there's only a couple, I think about three or four aircraft that can be compared to the 27. Um, yeah, seriously. The main thing I bring is being able to tie things into greater context and compare to other types in a similar role, and I just got nothing. Yeah, it's very, it's very tough to find uh, similar aircraft, especially since the design is very different from what a quote unquote typical uh, observation aircraft that we see on the right. This one also has the, uh, the this one being Douglas O38B, um, also has two positions. Uh, it is also a biplane design as signified by the two wings. I don't recall it being Seska plane. Um, it can carry a forward firing machine gun, uh, a dorsal machine gun, and 400 pounds of bombs, whereas the Breguet 33, quote unquote, um, has a slightly more powerful engine um, and carries a whopping five times the amount of bombs, as well as having uh, the, um, the better armament. Um, this is also one of the reasons why I stated that I'm not sure if, uh, if the earlier um, mounting brackets were available on either side of the engine because uh, in some of the um, some of the literature it's specifically mentioned that the 33 quote unquote uh, has uh, two forward firing machine guns and the only two that we've ever seen are uh, would be in around this location on either side of the engine. Now this leads me to believe that the 33 may have been a misnomer in terms of its military application and was actually the 273. Um, again, it's hard to find uh, exact information on all of this just because of the nature of poor documentation. Um, sometimes there's mistranslation in original documentation or uh, it's possible that maybe the NACA uh, circular overheard 33, but was actually meant to uh, represent the 273. I could see how the uh, confusion could come about. Um, so you, I sort of have to play devil's advocate here just in case. 
Um, this one we know for sure it has to be 273 because of the markings on the uh, on the rear tail. Um, we can see that it does carry uh, a lot of bombs on the underwing racks. The defensive gunner has at least two separate drums in order to reload. And we can also see the two separate um, bombing missions that it would find itself using. Namely, uh, short or near for a rapproché and uh, long or far for lointain. Uh, it's given its uh, standard radius of action and what it would be expected to carry uh, for such a mission. So, for example, in a short bom uh, bombing mission, um, it's going to use a... Uh, it's not going to have fuel in the, um, the bomb bay. That's going to be for more bombs. It'll use uh, 50 kilogram or 100 kilogram bombs in the uh, in the wing racks and potentially within the um, the bomb bay itself sometimes those are used for sl smaller bombs so the 50 kilogram or 25 kilogram bombs would be in there um, and you're gonna you're gonna get about 815 kilograms of bombs on such a mission and slightly over half of that uh, for twice the distance on a long mission uh, again in this case the, there is fuel in the bomb bay, or where the bomb bay would normally uh, be. Now, interestingly, um, I'm very conflicted on this photo. Um, I was looking at other photos earlier today, and I may have actually made a slight error in this, and this actually isn't the TOE, but just simply the 272. Now, the reason I say this is that, um, as previously mentioned, there's uh, some sort of issues with the uh, nomenclature and how uh, people have named several of the photos or attributed several of the photos to variants of the Breguet 27. Um, so if we rely on, um, on Wikipedia, because it seems to be the only one that, the only source, I guess we'll, we'll name it, as mentioning all the separate variants. We have the prototype 270 mentioned earlier, which devolves into the 270 period. Um, there is a second prototype that was called the 270.01, which most people just uh, put it with the 270. There was then a 271 that is kind of only just an aircraft uh, upgrade or an engine upgrade, I mean. There's a there's a, a about four about four dozen of them are built. Um, we have the thirty three or the, at least two thirty threes, which are high altitude or long distance aircraft. Um, one of them gets renamed the the twenty seven S for some reason. Um, a second thirty three is is named the three hundred thirty point oh one which I guess is later redesignated 33, I'm not 100% sure on, on what the eventual naming convention for that one was. We saw the 273, which uh, was essentially the same as a 271, um, but just has a, uh, is built for an export market. So 273s would find themselves performing the same roles as 271s, but they're sold to uh, China and um, Venezuela. Uh, Brazil also manages to get uh, several uh, 270s, but um, those aren't like a specifically different model uh, from the rest. They're not uh, they're not built solely as an export variant. All that to say that we then come to the above left aircraft. Now. Uh, this is commonly marked as the 274, and there are several problems with that that we will uh, get to see a little bit more on later. But the main point and uh, contention I have with the, it being the 274 is that it doesn't have the same engine from what you would normally see. Now I say this because uh, we have a, I believe this is a Polish PZ, um, PZL, I think it's a 6, I forget. Um, 
but it's supposed to have the exact same engine as the one seen above. But we can see that they're not. Um, the nose structure of this engine for the, the quote unquote 274 is far too different from the nose cone on the Polish fighter we have. So what is it? Well, I was looking into some sources and it's very hard to find a, um, a match with the 272 TOE or the 272. Now, what were those versions? To put it simply, the 272 was a uh, slight variant of a 270. It just had a, a Gnome Rhone 9 KDRS. So uh, it's a radial engine that they were using. It has nine cylinders and built by Gnome Rhone. Um, only two were ever built. Now, it's possible that this would be a 272. Um, but at the time, I didn't find any photos that that gave uh, from any other aircraft that had a 9K DRS that matched. So I thought it was the TOE, which is the uh, Théâtre des Opérations Extérieures. What that means is it's uh, essentially the French wanted a variation of the 270 that could be used for harsh colonial conditions. Um, Sahara conditions, uh, very dry climates, are typically more or better suited for radial engines because they don't have a liquid cooling system. And so they because don't. Because you don't suck air through a fil uh, through a ri small radiator. Yeah. So, uh, so initially I thought it was a TOE, but the problem is that there's only one TOE that was ever built, and it uses a a Renault nine FAS engine. I've never seen a photo of the 9FAS. I can't find a photo of, an, uh, of a 9FAS. Any search I do only brings me motorcycles, which isn't helpful. Now, uh, I had managed to find a, uh, a separate aircraft that appears to have the uh, same nose, but uh, I just didn't have time uh, to, uh, or at least I don't believe I managed to have time to uh, transfer it onto my PC and add it. So I believe that this famous photo always applied to the 274 is actually a 272. And um, we can also see uh, what I believe are the uh, leading edge tanks. And I say this because the um, we've seen the wings before. The wings were always flat. They didn't seem to have any ribbing on them. And we can kind of see this uh, well, we can see this here and also at the edge. Now, are those specifically wing tanks? I I don't know. I'm seeing some ribs here as well. So I think they're wing tanks. I could be wrong. Um, regardless, it's a 272, uh, and I'm glad that uh, I've been able to resolve that for Wikipedia, who's been saying that that's a 274 for God knows how long. Um, and getting back to the 274 itself, this is why there is a problem with with giving or attributing the 274 to the prior aircraft that we've seen. The 274 was a civilian version only. And we know this for a fact because, well, the 274 has only one example built, and it was used by a, a uh, Mrs. Marise Hiltz. Uh, I believe she's a French aviator, um, one of the uh, women pioneers, uh, aviators uh, of the time. And the aircraft was raced in a, um, in a flying competition or a flying racing competition uh, named the Hélène Boucher Cup. Uh, it was a yearly race where all competitors were women uh, and was named after a French woman, Hélène Boucher, who died in a uh, tragedy flying accident in 1934. The first race was held in 1935, um, and this aircraft specifically would race in 1936. Uh, sadly, I can't find any other information on this race itself, um, but suffice to say that there are examples, or there are at least two photos uh, of Mrs. Hiltz in uh, Breguet 27s, and at least one that has to be, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the 274. 
Now, lastly, there is one version of the Breguet 270 that does not have a separate designation, uh, but was used for, well, uh, important jobs nonetheless. Um, that being any of the quote-unquote war-weary planes um, would be converted, essentially just change the box because that's uh, it's all built on that main spar, and it becomes a transport slash liaison aircraft. Oh, they um, finally combined the uh, canopies. Isn't that nice? Yeah, exactly. They got a they got little shades too. Anything to uh, to impress the higher ups. So these two aircraft, um, there's not much known. Uh, as far as I understand it, they would have used whatever engines that the aircraft would have had at the time. So if it's a 270 that wasn't upgraded to a 271 or 273, etc., it just uses whatever it has. Um, the box is a, I don't want to say custom application. Um, we can see that these two boxes appear to be different. Um, the top one has far fewer windows. And different glazing looks like the uh, bottom one has windows pointing upwards. And I don't think the angles are rounded in the same way on the top one. Mm -hmm. It's a little hard to tell um, the cockpit one. They seem to have the same angles for the front, but everything behind the cockpit's glass uh, is uh, is different. There's just, you would expect a window here, uh, which doesn't exist. Um, and the markings and what have you that uh, that are painted, at least on the right side, don't match up. Um, you can kind of see a little footstep, same thing on here, uh, but these footsteps appear to be different, um, different sizes or different positions. So I don't know if one is specifically for um, uh, one is for the pilot and the other is for guests. Um, the other thing to note as well is that the uh, there's a door. The, the position of the door has also been changed, um, or at the very least has a, a different aspect to it um, for the, uh, the distinguished guests of the, um, of the pilot. And that brings us to the end of the, uh, the PowerPoint. So uh, this one took me a lot more translating and a little bit more uh, diving into to find all of the uh, NACA, uh, NACA um, circulations, um, which let me see if I can find them again. I know I had found them before and I, I think I left them out as a source, which is slightly annoying. Um, there are a bunch that can be found. Um, let me see if I can... Damn it. Uh, essentially, just type in NACA Aircraft Circular. You'll be able to find them. It's a uh, university libraries, uh, UNT Digital Library. They have the entire collection. As far as I know, there's something like uh, 180 to 200 uh, separate documents. They're all about, uh, I'd say, between 7 and 15 pages, so not very long. And they cover a lot of interesting aircraft if you're ever interested in that. Um, also, big shout out to a um, a library in France. They were able to uh, get me a bunch of the um, these magazines for La Bataille de France, which have a lot of information and a lot of anecdotal uh, stories and memoirs from uh, French pilots. So, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I cannot highly I cannot recommend the Icar series highly enough. Um, otherwise. Uh, I think that's going to be a wrap for today. Um, I'm just trying to check over my notes to see if I haven't missed anything. Um, with regards to the export contracts, uh, I mentioned that uh, Brazil, China, and Venezuela uh, got an aircraft. Um, specifically, uh, the numbers I can find are that the uh, Brazilians were given seven 20, uh, Breguet 27s or 270s. Um, Venezuela received three of those as well. They received a further 15 273s, and the Chinese received six 273s. Uh, anything you want to add, uh, X? Not really. This thing is just kind of weird. It's one of those <laughs> in a war types that kind of it just gets on. 
Um, I mean, the sesquip plane is kind of interesting. It's a thing that you see in interwar period a decent amount, especially that sort of short lower wing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the earliest sesquip planes are things like Newports from World War One, where the uh, bottom wing has really short cord and the top wing is just longer rather than mm -hmm. wider. Um, but, I mean, it's just it's interesting. It's weird, and there's it's hard to find things that are similar enough to give it greater context. Mm -hmm. I think it should be kind of interesting comparing to some of the later ones like the uh, Storch and the Lysander. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of that, once we get to either the Storch or the Lysander, it'll be interesting to compare those two aircraft with each other um, because of how wildly different their designs are um, and how uh, they uh, they will shape up um, against each other for kind of the same goals. Um, I guess I should also mention the uh, the combat history of the 27 because it was used during World War II. Um, as mentioned, it was designed in uh, late 20s and was purchased and used in the 1930s on. Uh, by the time of World War II and the Battle of France, there were still about 100 of the aircraft still uh, in flight or serviceable. Uh, and they would be seen uh, used for many of the missions that were prescribed uh, in earlier uh, documentation, namely observation, uh, reconnaissance, and uh, bombing. I don't know of too many uh, stories of it actually performing night fighting, uh, although it did exist as a possibility. Um, the aircraft itself never really had much of a chance. There's a few other designs that we have seen or will see in the future, um, stuff like the Fairy Battle and so on, that just never really um, had a leg to stand on, so to speak. Uh, in a combat situation, um, they'd find themselves in a, at a horrible disadvantage due to their low speed, lack of defensive armament, um, or just lack of armor and ill preparation if it meant uh, regarding uh, pilot doctrine or training. All these factors combined meant that the Breguet 27 would be pulled from front lines relatively early into the combat, into the fight, and would see itself doing uh, some uh, secondary duties and um, duties in locations that didn't necessarily put it under too much uh, of a threat for uh, for combat. So uh, while it didn't necessarily leave a very large mark, whether it's against the Germans or for the French themselves, uh, it is still a uh, rather interesting aircraft. And um, the next one up will be a P-43. So we will, we will get to talk about the Republic Lancer. Um, that's Ooh. also going to be a very interesting aircraft. Uh, and I hope to uh, to speak to you all then.